the student. At this point, I should explain what had happened to me since that summer day when I last hugged my dear and wise professor and promised to keep in touch. I didn't keep in touch. In fact, I lost contact with most of the people I knew in college, including my beer-drinking friends and the first woman I ever woke up to in the morning. The years after graduation hardened me into someone quite different from the strutting graduate who left campus that day headed for New York City, ready to offer the world all his talent. That world, I discovered, was not all that interested. I wandered around my early 20s, paying rent and reading classifieds, and wondering why the lights were not turning green for me. My dream was to become a famous musician. I played the piano, but after several years of dark, empty nightclubs, broken promises, bands that kept breaking up, and producers who seemed excited about everyone but me, the dream soured. I was failing for the first time in my life. At the same time, I had my first serious encounter with death. My favorite uncle, my mother's brother. The man who had taught me music, taught me to drive, teased me about girls, throw me a football. That one adult whom I targeted as a child and said, that's who I want to be when I grow up, died of pancreatic cancer at the age of 44. He was a short, handsome man with a thick mustache, and I was with him for that last year of his life, living in his apartment just below him. I watched his strong body wither, then bloat, saw him suffer night after night, doubled over at the dinner table, pressing on his stomach, his eyes shut, his mouth contorted in pain. Ah, oh, God, he would moan. Ah, oh, Jesus. The rest of us, my aunt, his two young sons, me, stood there silently, like cleaning the plates, averting our eyes. It was the most helpless I have ever felt in my life. One night in May, my uncle and I sat on the balcony of his apartment. It was a breezy and warm night. He looked out towards the horizon and said through gritted teeth that he wouldn't be around to see his kids into the next school year. He asked if I would look after him. I told him not to talk that way. He stared at me sadly. He died a few weeks later. After the funeral, my life changed. I felt as if time were suddenly like precious, water going down an open drain. And I could not move quickly enough. No more playing music at half-empty nightclubs. No more writing songs in my apartment, songs that no one would even hear. I returned to school. I earned a master's degree in journalism and took the first job offered as a sports writer. Instead of chasing my own fame, I wrote about famous athletes chasing theirs. I worked for newspapers and freelanced for magazines. I worked at a pace that knew no hours, no limits. I would wake up in the morning, brush my teeth, and sit down at the typewriter in the same clothes I slept in. My uncle had worked for a corporation and hated it. Hated it. Same thing, every day, and I was determined never to end up like him. That's a contradiction, because before I thought he said that he wanted to be just like him. I bounced around from New York to Florida and eventually took a job in Detroit as a columnist for the Detroit Free Press. The sports appetite in that city was insatiable. They had professional teams in football, basketball, baseball, hockey, and it matched my ambition. In a few years, I was not only penning columns, I was writing sports books, doing radio shows, and appearing regularly on TV, spouting my opinions on rich football players and hypocritical college sports programs. I was part of the media thunderstorm that now soaks our country. I was in demand. I stopped renting. I started buying. I bought a house on a hill. I bought cars. I invested in stocks and built portfolios. I was cranked to fifth gear. And everything I did, I did on a deadline. I exercised like a demon. I drove my car at breakneck speed. I made more money than I had ever figured to see. I met a dark-haired woman named Janie, who somehow loved me despite my schedule and constant absences. 
We married after 17-year courtship. Oh, sorry, a seven-year. I was going to say 17. Mm. I was back to work a week after the wedding. I told her and myself that we one day would start a family, something she wanted really bad. But that day never came. Instead, I buried myself into my accomplishments because with accomplishments, I believe I could control things. I could squeeze in every last piece of happiness before I got sick and died, like my uncle before me, which I figured was my natural fate. As for Maury, well, I thought about him now and then. The things he had taught me about being human and relating to others. But it was always in the distance, as if from another life. Over the years, I threw away my mail that came from Brandeis University, figuring they were only asking for money, which they probably were. So I did not know of Maury's illness. The people who might have told me were long forgotten, their phone numbers buried in some packed away box in the attic. It might have stayed that way had I not been flicking through the TV channels late one night when something caught my ear. Dot, dot, dot. Done. Now I'd like you guys to answer your questions. I appreciate you listening to me. Bye.